You're listening to the Legal Talk Network. Hello, I'm Monica Bay. And I'm Bob Ambrogi. We've been writing about law and technology for more than 30 years. That's right. During that time, we've witnessed many changes and innovations. Technology is improving the practice of law, helping lawyers deliver their services faster and cheaper. Which benefits not only lawyers and their clients, but everyone. And moves us closer to the goal of access to justice for all. Tune in every month as we explore new legal technology and the people behind the tech. Here on Law Technology Now. Welcome to Law Technology Now on the Legal Talk Network. This is your host, Bob Ambrogi. Well, within the realm of legal technology, it seems that everybody's been talking uh, this year about artificial intelligence, and any number of companies and law firms have been jumping on the AI bandwagon. It was therefore not surprising that the alternative legal services provider Axiom recently rolled out an AI offering. But maybe what was a little bit unusual about it was the deliberative approach the company went through before the rollout, taking uh, taking some time to study the space before deploying AI to its clients. Today, we're going to speak to the senior executive at Axiom who oversaw and continues to oversee Axiom's AI efforts, Paul Carr. We're going to talk to him about Axiom's AI offering and about AI more generally in the legal space. So, uh, Paul Carr, welcome to Law Technology Now. Thanks very much, Bob. It's good to talk to you again. I wonder if we could start by, uh, let me just ask you to Tell us uh, a little bit about your own background. Uh, sure. Um, so I um, uh, joined Axiom <clears throat> back in 2008, so have been um, overseeing uh, the firm since, uh, you know, over that time period when we've, we've you know, grown um, pretty substantially from a few hundred employees to uh, north of 2,000. Um, uh, and just... Prior to Axiom, I had been um, leading one of the international divisions at American Express. I was their global head of strategy before that, and then um, started my career at Accenture and and uh, and the Boston Consulting Group. So, um, so really been focused on, you know, building out and scaling, uh, building out the capabilities and scaling um, Axiom's business. Uh, um, uh, you know, over the last eight years, most recently been focused on, um, you know, our approach to technology as as well as specifically uh, to, you know, all things artificial intelligence. Well, I want to talk a lot more about all of that, but um, let me ask you to familiarize our listeners with what Axiom is, because I'm not sure all of them will know. So tell us just sort of the, give us the big picture on what Axiom is. Sure. Um yeah, Axiom is uh, an alternate uh, alternate legal service provider, as you as you as you mentioned before. We um, we are a tech enabled legal services company, um, one of the largest we believe uh, in the in the space. Our clients to be um, global 1,000 legal departments. We sell exclusively into corporations, um, as distinct from you know law firms and other providers. Um, and, and what we are, uh, we have two broad categories of offerings. Um, one, uh, is on our talent platform in which we're providing, um, you know, really talented, uh, lawyers or teams of lawyers to, uh, to supplement and augment, um, a legal departments team. Um, then our contracts platform where we're providing, you know, end-to-end uh, solutions to uh, execute contracting work, whether um, the drafting, negotiation, execution, you know, storage, analysis um, of uh, commercial agreements. And in service of that part of our business, we have, um, we combine, uh, you know, obviously a, a talented a bunch of people as well as technology and um Process methodology to uh, to execute that work. So, are you are you a law firm? Do you have lawyers working for you? That's a great question. We are technically not a law firm. Um, we have we do have lawyers working for us. We have 
about 1,500 lawyers who are who are doing work um, for our clients, um, but we are not uh, a law firm. So we're very disciplined and diligent about um, operating, uh, you know, appropriately in in the um, in the regulatory framework of you know the practice of law and so on. Paul, I know that one of the distinguishing characteristics of Axiom is that it describes itself as a a tech-enabled legal services company. Describe that for us. What does that mean? So most everything we do um, is enabled by technology. And fundamentally, I mean, we are operating in a, you know, a half a trillion dollar information-based industry, um, which logically, um, you know, finding, modernizing, finding better ways of doing work, uh, delivering legal services and, and modernizing the way that legal work is done is necessarily going to involve technology. So in, um, in, in everything we do for our clients, we are, uh, we're employing um, technology to streamline the interface, to manage workflow, to um, structure and you know, provide analytics uh, around data. Um, so it's a fundamental and central part of uh, of what we're uh, providing our clients. And so you're also a services company, you're a technology company. Uh, you know, it's, how do you kind of straddle those two areas? How do you define exactly what that is or how do your clients understand, what do they understand that to be? Yeah, yeah, we, so we, um, so <laughs> straddle is the right term. I mean, we, <laughs> we refer to ourselves as a, as a, as a tech enabled services company. Um, and you know, partly, we, you know, we are not unique in that regard. There, there are other industries with providers who who provide heavily technology-enabled services. <clears throat> Specifically, we think it's important um, in the legal industry, uh, particularly for where we are in the evolution, um, because uh, y- you know, in order to um, realize the benefits that technology can provide. Um, we've just seen that, y- y- you know, you need to do a lot of work in and around the technology. You need to standardize processes. You need to structure information. You need to uh, re-engineer um, workflows. And so we've just found um, our ability to add value and provide benefits to clients um, is far greater by providing not just a tool or a piece of technology, um, but a more integrated solution that certainly includes technology, but also includes a lot of the process and standardization that needs to go on um, around it. The uh, legal industry has a reputation for being... uh slow to adopt new technology, to be uh, perhaps even uh, resistant to some areas of new technology. So how do you ease the transition, I guess, for for your clients? How do you uh, make them understand the value of or get them to accept the use of of technology in delivering legal services? Yeah, I mean, we... um we we spend uh, you know an unhealthy number of hours talking about just this, the the topic of adoption um and uh you know it's true uh, uh technology um legal tech as it were probably holds more promise than has demonstrated progress um notwithstanding the fact that there is a lot of investment um capital flowing into the legal tech segment um you know, we think fundamentally the, um, the 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 reason that adoption has been, you know, is a challenge, um, is uh, is because of this uh, dynamic that I mentioned before, and the need to embrace a completely different what we call production system, um, in order to actually leverage and use that technology. And so we, you know, we think about an analogy of you know, providing a conveyor belt to a blacksmith um, and expecting the industrial revolution to take hold. Well, of course it can't because you need to build a factory and a conveyor belt in order to deliver speed, efficiency, um, and better outcomes. And so what we're in the business of is providing and building 
the factory or the production system around technology in order to deliver better outcomes to clients. So when we engage with clients, what we're really talking about with them is, um, is how we can deliver better performance. However you choose to me- you know, measure performance could be um, a better risk management, it could be efficiency, it could be speed, particularly in the area of contracting. Um, it could be adherence to policy. Um, but where, where we try to encourage clients to get on board is really talking about a set of performance outcomes as opposed to uh, talking about a bunch of tools that clients are then having to try and work out what to do with themselves. Let's start to talk about uh, Axiom AI. Uh, you recently announced uh, that you are going to be uh, – that you've introduced uh, – Axiom AI that uh, is something that you've been thinking about for a while and and rolled it out more recently. Um, so tell us, let's begin by just asking, let me ask you what Axiom AI is. Tell us about it. Yeah, so Axiom AI is, um, you know, I, I would say it's a, it's, it's, it's a formalization of a pathway we've been on for the last three or four years. Um, and, uh, and as you, as you mentioned, um, you know, we've been testing. Um, we've been testing uh, different AI tools um, over the last three or four years um, in in the lab, as it were, to just understand um, how they perform. The area in particular that we've been focused on, which is you know in relation to the contracts platform part of our business, is really around the extraction, the tools that you know, extract information from commercial agreements, from contracts. Um, and, and we feel that, um, you know, in general, artificial intelligence technology um, has tremendous applicability to certainly contracting work, but legal more broadly. Um, and, and, and we think it can be truly transformative. Um, uh, and the and the and the development of the technology, the advancement and evolution of the technology has changed a lot in the last three or four years. And we just felt um, that that the technology was getting to a point where it was sufficiently accurate um, that we could move it from the lab, as it were, into production um, and into client engagements. Um, and so we felt that we wanted to uh, sort of formalize. Axiom AI as the program where we are testing, trialing, and then um, moving into uh, BAU production processes, client engagements, um, the AI tools and techniques and, and technology. So as I understand it, Axiom AI is really kind of two components. There, there's this, uh, the R&D side of it, uh, the, the research into, uh, uh, into products and applications and use cases, and then there's the production side of it, to sending it out to your clients. Is that, do I have that right? Accurate. Yeah, that that is exact. That is exactly right. I mean, we feel that, um, <clears throat> you know, we're at the beginning as an industry. I think, well, generally, uh, you know, corporate America, but legal, uh, the legal industry is at the very, very beginning of. Uh, of the of the AI journey, um, and so we feel it's important to have an R and D component to the program where we're, um, you know, basically testing and partnering with uh, with experts to understand um, what the art of the possible is and what's out there. Um, and so that's the R and D component, as you mentioned, um, and then you know the production component is where we're. You know, where we're feeling that the technology is sufficiently robust and and accurate um, and consistent um, the, to justify moving into client engagements. That's where we're moving it into our client work, and obviously, you know, you know, integrating the workflow and you know, building it into the into our value propositions. So um, that's exactly right. We we think we think about the program, or we we sort of compartmentalize. The Axiom AI program into those two pieces. Paul, stay with us. We are going to take a short break to hear a word from our sponsors, and we're going to be right back to continue this discussion. Starting your own solo practice is tough. 
Hi, my name is Adriana Linares, and I host a show called New Solo on Legal Talk Network. In it, I interview successful lawyers who've gone solo and experts in marketing, management, technology, and everything else you need to know that you didn't learn in law school. Find us on iTunes, Google Play, or at LegalTalkNetwork.com. Welcome back to Law Technology Now. We're talking with Paul Carr, uh, senior executive overseeing Axiom's AI efforts about Axiom's new Axiom AI offering, uh, integrating artificial intelligence into the services it delivers its clients. I, I thought it was really fascinating. I mean, you've, you've talked about this already, but I, I thought it was really fascinating that you took such a deliberative approach to rolling out AI. You and I have talked about this before, and, and, and you've talked about the fact that you, if I have it right, took, took a couple of years to really kind of look at uh, the market and, and the industry and, and think about some of the tools that were out there. Uh, you know, I, I, from where I sit, I, I get, uh, I get uh, emails every day from companies telling me they've, they've just rolled out this or that AI product, uh, few of which actually are, <laughs> are AI products. Uh, wh- wh- why did you think it was important to, uh, to kind of go through that process of, of getting, uh, you know, sort of taking, taking the temperature of the space before delivering some of these products to your clients? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot about um, there's a lot about what's going on now with artificial intelligence, which is reminiscent of you know the internet in the late '90s, and um, you know, there's a lot of uh, y- y- noise and hubris um, and um, and testing going on, you know. But we're really in the what we're really driven by, motivated by, is uh, you know, how do you apply? How do you apply these tools? How do you apply artificial intelligence to, you know, to deliver more value for clients? And that requires a pretty pragmatic approach to how, in reality, um, this technology is going to be used in practice. You know, in client engagements where, you know, we're on the hook to deliver a bunch of outcomes. Um, and so, and so, and so, we felt that, you know. D- that's something that you want to take a thoughtful approach to and, um, and be sure that the technology can actually uh, perform in a robust way, um, you know, at industrial strength. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's why we felt, you know, we, we, te- we did a lot of testing and a lot of piloting to simulate how this would operate in, um, in, in uh, you know, at scale. And, um, and, and, and even in the last three or four years, we saw a tremendous uh, improvement in the performance of the various tools. Um, and that's not going to stop. That's going to continue to improve. I mean, the technology uh, just, you know, there's been somewhat of a revolution. Um, artificial intelligence is kind of a, you know, an unhelpful name. Uh, you know, it's such a broad umbrella, but there's been somewhat of a, a revolution in the last three or four years, particularly around text analysis, and the technology that has really made progress is is machine learning, um, and uh, and that has revolutionised outside of legal um, the ability to manage uh, to to interpret and uh, and 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 translate actually texts from one language to another, um, and the application of that. You know, to the legal space is uh, has meant that these tools have dramatically improved, um, and so that's something we've been monitoring and watching. And uh, and as I said, I mean, we felt in the last in the last period of time, um, the the technology has has been, you know, robust enough and accurate enough to be able to uh, move into kind of production strength. And you've started out through a, a partnership with Kira. Um, and, and I think uh, you, you've kind of taken the approach of, of looking at, at partnerships with other uh, experts or, or companies that are already working in the artificial intelligence space. Um, but your your first uh, kind of production offering here, I guess, uh, focuses on, on M&A due diligence uh, using Kira. W- Tell us about that. What, how does this work? What, what are you offering? With so we have an offering, um, uh, M&A diligence and integration, where basically we come in and support um, 
clients who are going through a major acquisition or a major spin-off. Um, and, uh, and we have a very just efficient <clears throat> mechanism for conducting either the diligence or the post integration work where, uh, you know, the, the, the company is, is, uh, is needing to work through, um, risk analysis and change of control and assignability, uh, type implications. So we go through, um, we, we, uh, you know, we go through and extract that information. We structure it in a very specific way. Um, and convert that into a set of recommendations for the client. Um, and so this is the offering where we have started uh, to apply, um, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, Kira in particular, where they, um, where, where, where they are helping us um, identify and extract uh, text-based information uh, for the most part. Um, to remove that burden from our lawyers um, so that they can focus on the more interpretive um, and interpretive work and the structuring of recommendations. Um, and so that's where we're starting. It's a very specific use case, you know, very relevant to our um, diligence and M&A, diligence and integration offering. But, you know, we're looking actively at where uh, tools can be applied to uh, to other use cases, which we think there are a number um, in the contracts in the contracts realm. But those other use cases will be within the contracts realm, as you just said. You're not looking. Is that where your focus is primarily right now? Yeah, we, our th- that's where um, that's where our focus is. I mean, we have a number of offerings that are focused very specifically in contracts. These are the offerings on our contracts platform, and so we're applying that lens in looking um, at where uh, artificial intelligence tools can supercharge those offerings. Um, you know, obviously there are uh, there are tools that um, focused on, you know, whether it be litigation or, um, or other areas. Um, but that's not, uh, that's not an area that, you know, we're not focused on those areas right now. Can, can you talk about any of the other uh, applications relating to contracts that you're looking at at this point? Well, um, there are, um, there are two, uh, areas where, uh, where we see the tools operating principally, one area is the identification and extraction of information from agreements, um, and we're leveraging, we're doing that on the um, m and on our M&A offering. Um, but some of the tools they specialize in contract types. So some, you know, as Kira uh, is really helpful for the information you need as part of the M&A process. You know, there are other tools that focus on, for for instance, financial documentation. Um, uh, you know, so ISDA agreements and other derivatives contracts. Um, and then there are other tools that focus on a broader range of agreements. Um, so, so use cases specifically around the very efficient, uh, you know, um, finding and extracting information from different agreement sets is certainly one uh, kind of area of use cases we're looking at. The other area, which I think is, is, um, is I think a little further behind, but um, but but it's more focused on the the creation of and the negotiation of contracts. So um, so you know there are tools that um, that that are aiming to improve leverage artificial intelligence to streamline the approval process, for instance, as an agreement gets created, um, and so to very quickly identify where. Uh, you know, an agreement is um, off standard, or uh, um, or, or uh, you know how how it needs to be uh, go through the approval process. So, so to streamline that whole process, I would say that's an area we're watching, but it's a little further behind the data extraction use case. What's the rollout process like with your clients? I mean, you're working with corporate legal departments exclusively, I, as I understood what you said earlier. How receptive are they to artificial intelligence tools? How uh, understanding are they uh, of the technology? Um, you know, I would say uh, they are very interested um, and intrigued 
um, by uh, the application of uh, artificial intelligence tools. Um, you know, our our experience is, is, and I think it's probably true outside of legal as well. You know, I would say global 1,000 companies, Fortune 500 companies, are all um, all have initiatives underway uh, to identify areas where you know artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics um, can be applied to the business. And legal is no exception. Um, so most legal departments, uh, you know, are actively looking for ways in which uh, artificial intelligence tools can be applied. So there is a high degree of interest um, and motivation. Um, on the other hand, there is um, there is a lack of understanding uh, of you know uh, specifically what tools are out there, what they can do, what the pros and cons are, what are the critical capabilities that need to be developed in order to bridge those tools. Um, so a lot of the conversations we get into with corporate legal functions is frankly, an educational conversation, which is really, uh, you know, painting a picture of the landscape, um, giving them a window a little bit into the technology and how it works, um, where it can be used, where it makes sense versus where it doesn't make sense. Um, and so, and so I think, you know, I think that the industry generally is on a bit of an education pathway. I mean, it's complex. Machine learning technology is complex and it's rapidly evolving. Um, so I think it's 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 almost like the analogy of there's a sh there's a new shiny toy out there and everyone's kind of grappling with how how to use it and how to apply it. Is the use case primarily efficiency? Is is it that AI can drive down the costs of del delivering legal services, uh, or are there other reasons that uh, that you see AI as uh, as important for the legal industry? Yeah, I think that's a great that's a great question. And actually, what we feel is that the use the the benefits or the the you know the performance benefits um, of applying these tools is going to vary, um, evolve over time. I mean, in contracting right now, um, you know, artificial intelligence tools tend to deliver efficiency. They automate. Um, or streamline the way in which you know information can be extracted from a contract. Um, you, you know, and so that is arguably an an an, an, effi an efficiency mechanism. But we think that um, we think that there are uh, the benefits will go way beyond uh, way beyond efficiency um, and uh, and and sort of automation. Um, and, and specifically, you know, we think the ability to understand um, hundreds or thousands, understand the risks in or the opportunities or synergies hidden and buried um, in hundreds or thousands of agreements um, will open up all sorts of possibilities in terms of better um, decision making, um, providing insights to corporations that they simply don't have today. Um, it, it, it'll deliver speed, which is something in the contracting world is very important um, and, and leads to, you know, acceleration of sales or, you know, acceleration of revenue recognition. And so we think that efficiency is, is, is you know, a sort of a starting point um, we see in contracts. But what, what we think is, you know, likely to be truly transformative is a whole set of um, benefits which uh, you know which are hard to imagine for where we are in the journey right now you know we all hear, hear a lot about uh, just a lot of the hype around artificial intelligence in law and and a lot of the hype uh, uh, you know makes makes the point of uh, 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 you know, you'll see headlines on robots replacing lawyers, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but I mean, it seems that the uh, the state of artificial intelligence today is is not that uh, uh, the machine learning tools or artificial intelligence tools are are replacing lawyers, but are making the delivery of legal services more efficient uh, and in conjunction with lawyers. Um, 
where do you see this heading? I mean, what, what, what do you see as the future of AI in, in the legal industry? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I uh, it's hard to predict. I mean, it's hard to. It's sort of like saying it's sort of like reflecting on, you know, I, I mean, this analogy of it feels a little bit like the internet in the late '90s and sitting around in the late '90s thinking where the internet's going to evolve to. I mean, it was. It, it would have been hard to predict um, exactly all of the you know ways that the internet transformed the way we buy goods and services, the way we communicate with each other with, you know, with respect to social media and all of these things. So I, I think sitting where we are right now, it's, it's pretty difficult to, um, uh, you know, to predict where, where this all ends up, where this all shakes out. I mean, out, our view, uh, you know, we, we, we do believe a couple of things though. One is that, it is one of those things. It is one of those technologies, um, one of those movements that we believe has the potential to be as disruptive or transformative as the internet was. Um, uh, firstly, uh, secondly, we we also think that this, you know, it is very seductive to uh, you know to paint a to paint a doomsday scenario where artificial intelligence replaces lawyers and all of that. Um, you know, uh, for, for we, we tend not to think uh, in those terms. We think it's going to be far more complementary. It's going to automate a bunch of work that lawyers actually don't like doing because it's repetitive and um, you, you, you know, and, and mind numbing. Um, but it allows lawyers to do the work, you know, the interpretive and judgment-based work. That um, that they much prefer and really enjoy, and so we're seeing that um, in our, you know, M and A and diligence offering in a very very small way. Um, but you know, our lawyers are spending less time leafing through a 25 page contract to find, you know, a particular clause, and they're spending you know more time reading, interpreting, um, and developing recommendations for clients. And I think that that's how this is going to shake out. I think actually that it's going to make uh, you know, it, it, it holds the promise of making legal work, you know, more interesting where lawyers are focused on the work that, um, uh, you know, that truly they are, that they are skilled at and that they are, the, you know, that they're trained to do, um, which, as I said, it, it's, it's advising, it's, it's, it's applying judgment um, and a bunch of different things like that. I mean, most lawyers, I'm sure you've seen the surveys, you know, surveys of, of, of what, lawyers, you know, in particular in in-house departments, um, you know, do, and, and there's an awful lot of the work that they do, which is, is, you know, it's rather repetitive and administrative. Um, so, so, so we think that artificial has the artificial intelligence has the, has the, um, holds the potential of, of, uh, of, of, of taking away and automating uh, a lot of that work, um, and allowing lawyers to focus on, uh, you know, on, on more value-added tasks. And not only do lawyers not want to do that repetitive work, but clients don't want to pay for it <laughs> if they don't have to. Clients don't want to pay for it. Lawyers don't want to do it. And, you know, it adds no value to the corporation in which a legal department sits. I mean, right. you know, most lawyers will lament the fact that they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're doing a bunch of repetitive work instead of out in front of their business partners in those corporations advising them um, uh, you know, and, and having a seat at the table and advising them on, on, um, on how to conduct business. And so, you know, and so we think that, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a possibility here of allowing lawyers to play more central and powerful and impactful roles, um, you know, in their corporations. Paul, we're just about out of time, but I did want to give you uh, an opportunity to share any uh, final thoughts you had on this topic before we wrap up. So is there anything else that you wanted to uh, say before we close? Well, final thought would be, um, would be, look, I mean, let's recognize that we're at the very beginning uh, of, of, of this, you know, movement. Um, uh, And, and we're all learning. Um, But look, artificial intelligence, it's something um, that, uh, that we need to be, and this is true of ourselves. It's true of, you know, in-house functions. It's, it's uh, something we're shifting and playing with and learning, and we need to keep, 
you know, we need to keep our heads um, uh, focused on it, the, you know, the, the sort of exciting vision that, that um, AI tools and technology affords, but at the same time, keep our feet sort of planted squarely on the ground and, uh, and take a pragmatic lens in terms, of, uh, in terms of where and how it can apply. Um, and, so, uh, and so we're excited about that. We're excited about what it could mean for Axiom, and we're excited about what it could mean for our clients. Well, Paul Carr, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. I really appreciated your speaking with me and talking about Axiom AI. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks so much, Bob. Well, that does it for this episode of Law Technology Now. Thanks to all of you for listening. Thanks to Paul Carr for taking the time to be with us today. If you like this show, if you like this podcast, please go to uh, Apple Podcasts and give us a nice review there. Until next time, this is Bob Ambrogi. Thanks for listening. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Thank you.